Happy Monday, everyone. This is Andrew Kimmins with Kimmins Toolworks. And <clears throat> today I have a few things that probably we've seen before, maybe, but they're still cool either way. And I just wanted to say, first off, um, if you're ever interested in anything, the things in these videos, or you have an idea for a custom build or a set or whatever, singles, pairs, doesn't really matter, email me at andrew at kimmonshandtools.com and I usually will get back within two to three days depending on how busy I am. Um, takes me a while sometimes to get around to everybody all the time. But I'll also say I've had way too much caffeine today so I'm moving a little bit fast. So bear with me. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk about what we've got going on here. Um, these are all curly maple and actually even all curly maple from the exact same batch. <clears throat> and the difference is blue dye. These are electric blue. Obviously these are stabilized as well. Uh, vacuum stabilized and heat cured as always. Um, some of the exotic woods I can't do that with. Like for example, Coca Bolo is one of those where if you try and stabilize it, you'll probably actually make it worse. Uh, ebony is the same way. Certain woods with super high density and with a super, you know, high resin content, not even worth trying. But for example, leopard wood, something like that, very high resin content, but it's not super dense. So it stabilizes just fine. But to take a coca bolo or an ebony and try and stabilize it, that's just bad idea. So I've tried it. Um, anyway, <clears throat> This is one set for one customer right here. This is a seven piece set. This is one set or one single for a different customer. This is a two inch pairing chisel. And then this three piece set in electric blue that's going out to a customer. Um, he actually has a mortise chisel too with this set, but I <laughs> discovered a defect in it. So I have to remake that chisel and I don't want him to wait on these. So. That's, that is the nice thing is it's like, if I notice something defective, it's going in the trash. I don't care if it's literally ready to go out the door and I, and I catch a defect. It just goes straight in the trash. Um, actually I cut them up first because I'm just, I'm weird like that. But anyway, I think the kind of the star of the show today is this little, this is a 16th inch bench chisel and it's made to the same, it's full length. Like you look at it it's the it's the same length as like your quarter inch and the I, I just I think that that's cool because getting a chisel that's full length and like I've even made 16th inch chisels to match pairing chisel sets which at that length they're like six and a half inches so that's a big it's a big blade but the size the overall length changes depending on the width of the chisel. For example, like the, these are all four inch blade until you get beyond half inch. Like this is a half inch, so it has a four inch blade. When you transition past that, they're four and a quarter. So from five eighths up to one inch are all four and a quarter. But then <clears throat> it goes up another quarter inch beyond that. So depending on the length, the, the wider chisels I do longer. So anyway, I could probably too, if anybody's interested, I could probably even go thinner than that. If anybody ever, you know, gets a wild hair and they're like, I want a 32nd inch chisel. I guarantee you I could pull that off. Now, it would not be easy. And that's kind of the cool thing is that every different chisel, every different type, every different size poses its own unique challenges. Like, there's a very real reason why this 16th inch chisel is the same price as this one inch chisel. And you look at that and you look at the two side by side and you're like, why would that even be? Obviously that's a lot more chisel. Yeah, it is. But this poses probably not only more unique and difficult challenges, but the risk of screwing this up and having to make this blade two or three times is pretty high. I have had to scrap two of these to get one that was straight before. 
and I'm getting I'm getting better at it and uh, they always tend to warp the same way and it's unique it's always right around the middle just a little kink not even like a flowing bend it's like a kink and I don't know why they're they get heat treated evenly they get quenched evenly and then there will just be that little in the middle and it's it's odd it happens in eighth inch too the eighth inch chisels will do the same thing but mostly those for whatever reason they try to bow up so <clears throat> it's always always a challenge it doesn't matter what particular tool you're making and especially since really you look at any of these they're tapered like they're wider back here than they are here they're ground to a thinner you know end and what that does is that that too makes them want to bow but it makes them want to bow this way and so that's another another factor that needs controlled in all of this <clears throat> there's a lot of little things that go into making a blade that's actually straight and at a rockwell high enough to be usable and i know a lot of manufacturers I have, I have had them all, and I have had many blades at 59, 60 Rockwell. And I will tell you right now, like, running A2 at 59 to 60 Rockwell is an absolute freaking waste of material. And, well, and, and you know, people are, well, you know, the softer, you know, steel has higher toughness to a point. Like, if you take A2 and you surpass 63 Rockwell, and you're running it into 64 and 65, which you can, uh, yeah, that, that holds true. But, I will tell you right now, this chisel at 63 Rockwell does not have less toughness than one made by somebody else at 60. I can take that and plunge that sucker into a piece of aluminum and torque it and try and crack the blade and try and chip the blade, and they don't, and they'll still shave hair. So, 63, if done properly and tempered properly, because when they come out of the forge, they're harder than 63. You have to temper them down to 63. So, that's kind of the way that that works. And I wanted to talk a little bit about something interesting that I discovered. Um, <clears throat> this was a while back, and I've, I have a couple customers that are really into metallurgy, and I've talked to them about this a little bit. And it's a unique phenomenon that I've discovered with A2. And I actually have the blade I discovered it with. Let me grab it real quick. <clears throat> By the way, this is all overstock stuff that I could still do like some kind of overstock special on or something like that. Like leftover things, stuff that you know, I can do discounted and they're all, they're all Tang style. None of that socket Tang, but this right here, I still have it, is the blade that I discovered a unique phenomenon with. And that's an inch and a quarter. And it's actually so old, it doesn't even have the mark. A few of these blades, I think this was from a batch of inch and a quarter that I did. That was the last batch I made before I started marking tools. And I have a few of those. And haven't sold them, haven't, you know, whatever. They've just been sitting over there. This one, though, I wouldn't sell because this was an experimental blade. And <clears throat> what I noticed, let me kind of go through the process for, for those who aren't familiar with heat treating. But you have what's called an austenitizing temperature, which essentially, to put it in simple terms, what you try to do is you take a piece of steel, and an, an, an annealed piece, like properly annealed, not a normalized piece of steel. I know a lot of people think that putting it in the forge and heating it up to, you know, 1550 degrees and taking it out and letting it cool and doing that three times. And they say, oh, that's annealed. It's not, it's not annealed at all. That's normalized and it's normalized three times. And really all you're doing is migrating carbon out of the steel and making it a worse piece of steel. So that literally, unless you're trying to normalize a piece of steel, do that once and one and done, you're good to go. But if you're trying to anneal a piece of steel, the correct way to anneal a piece of steel would be to bring it up to its astenitizing temperature, which 
is basically the point where carbon dissolves, which I'll get a little bit into that later. But to correctly anneal, you would bring it up to that temperature and then bring it down extremely slowly over the course of hours. And <clears throat> then you'd have an annealed piece of steel. But that's not something that a lot of people can do in-house. I mean, you can do it with electronic programmable forges for sure. You just put the program in there and you can anneal a piece of steel pretty easily. But um, most of the steel in the condition you buy it is annealed unless you screw it up. Like if you stick it in your forge and pull it out, you know, it may be hardened at that point if it's an air hardening material. But so a sanitizing temperature, you bring it up to the threshold where carbon melts into the interstitial spaces in the grain. And you do that <clears throat> because if you can get that carbon, that melted carbon distributed into the grain structure of the steel, then you quench it and it freezes that carbon in place. And it's like, it's like a lattice structure. The seal's like a lattice structure. And so you get it in there and then you freeze it into place. And what that does is when the steel cools, it allows that grain structure to distort. And that distortion of grain structure is what creates hardness because it's stress. So what you're trying to do when you're hardening a piece of steel is stressing it out. And after you aesthetize it, quench it, and then everything is stuck in that inter interstitial space and you have a distorted grain and a fully hardened piece of steel, you have to temper it. Because in that state, like you could take it and throw it at the ground and it might just break. It could shatter, it could fracture, you could have hairline cracks in it that you can't even see. And so it has to be stress relieved and that's what tempering is. So you take it and you heat it up enough to stress relieve it and pull the hardness down a little bit. And that's what makes a usable blade. And every steel has a different tempering temperature. And every steel has a different astenitizing temperature. And what the manufacturer recommends usually is not the best. Just, it's not the best for a cutting tool. Like a lot of times they will make heat treating recommendations based on, you know, dye making and stuff like that. So I know a lot of dudes that like, if they harden a piece of steel, they follow the manufacturer directions. And it's like, well, you have an underperforming piece of steel now because they didn't write those procedures for a blade. Like, and that's where blade making with tool steels, you have to, you have to experiment and you have to figure out for yourself what works and what doesn't. And <clears throat> this blade, is the result of an experiment. An accidental experiment, but an experiment nonetheless. Um, this is a piece of A2. And this went in the forge with a piece of M CPM M4. And I'll tell you right now, I temper, I triple temper CPM M4 at 1050 degrees. And we're talking two hours at a time. So, and between cycling up and down, it's a full day to temper a piece of CPM M4 because you're in the forge you, and you don't count the time heating up to 1,050 degrees. Once you get the material to 1,050 degrees and it's soaking at 1,050 degrees, that's when you start the clock and it's two hours from that point. And then you bring it down slowly and then you ramp it back up to 1,050 degrees. Then you bring it down slowly. And the third time, back up to 1,050 degrees for two hours a piece, ramp it down slowly. Because <clears throat> what you're trying to do in, in steels like CPM M4 is you're growing carbides too. Like you're not just softening the material, you're, you're growing carbides. And interesting thing, CPM M4, if you use cryo, you can temper it at 500 because you grew your carbides in cryo. So like, there's, <laughs> sky's the limit. You can experiment with stuff. It's fun. But anyway, this went into the forge at 1050 degrees. This is a piece of A2. And I discovered that this came out at about 64 Rockwell. And the funny thing is, <clears throat> is that like you take your astenitizing temperature and you quench it and you know, your hardness is here, your temperature's there, your temperature, your tempering temperature, as it goes up, the material softens and stress relieves until you hit a sweet spot. And with A2, if you continue to raise it, it'll get softer, softer, and softer, and hit another sweet spot at over a thousand degrees. 
And I found this interesting because I expected this piece of material to come out soft. This did not come out soft. This came out hard. This came out a little higher than the sweet spot. So which tells me you could probably raise the temperature to 1100 degrees and it would probably be at the sweet spot for this particular material in that range. But being that I haven't really tested that thoroughly, I wouldn't put it into real use. So I was actually pretty surprised to figure that out with A2. And I, <clears throat> I can't exactly answer what's going on with that. I mean, I'm, I don't know everything obviously. I don't even know necessarily enough about that. I would have to send it out to a lab to see what the heck's going on exactly with it, but I can suspect the same things happening that happens with most high-speed steels and CPM steels and really high alloy steels in that you're precipitating carbides. And the carbides, I mean, A2 it has enough um, carbide forming elements to do it for sure. Uh, not a lot. I mean, when you're looking at 5% chromium, like that's your primary, you know, alloying constituent in this, you're not going to grow a lot of carbides in it, but you will grow some carbides in it nonetheless. <clears throat> so I suspect that that may be happening in this case, but I'm going to tinker with this a little bit in the future moving forward and see what exactly I can do to take advantage of this. But uh, for the time being, it's going to remain a mystery unless I send it out and see what the heck happened to it and have it lab tested. So I'm interested in, in, in that and what the heck happened with that. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, I have quite a few though, like regular marked tang style blades over here that I'll probably end up, that's all that's left of the overstock discounted stuff. And yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and prep these to ship out and that pretty finish on there. This is one of those that I would like to add to my collection. I really want a big pairing chisel, but I have absolutely no use for one. And that's <clears throat> part of the reason why a lot of the tools that I make that I really would love to have in my own collection because it's not like I don't, you know, sometimes need some kind of a larger mortise chisel. It's just that I get by with what I have because I don't have time to make myself things. I pretty much take all the time I have and I put that into making things for my customers because they're the ones that actually need and use this stuff. I don't use it enough. Like I use my chisels on home projects in the house all the time. And I'm pretty abusive on them. I mean, no lie. I pounded one through plaster the other day and pretty half inch socket tank chisel. It's what I had. And so, you know, whatever. I use the crap out of my tools and I always have. And right now, what I have on my tool board over there is I have a half inch socket tank chisel. I have a half inch socket tang dovetail chisel which i love that thing my daughter actually loves that thing too she was carving wood with it the other day and she really likes that one but um other than that i have a tang style a2 one inch and then i have a 5 8 in cpm m4 and then i have a really weird oddball that i use for mortising the tang style um mortises and the handles and it's a, it's a one-off weird one. I'll have to have that in the video one of these days. It's super ugly because I just threw it on the grinder and just like made a weird thing. So I don't even know what that started out as. It was something else. And I just, it's like a Frankenstein. It's horrible, but it works and whatever. And then other than that, I have uh, the first four piece set I ever made. And <clears throat> I did the, the first batch I ever did was three four piece sets, was a one inch, a three quarter, a half and a quarter. And I know where the other two of the three first sets are. One of them, number one, is on my board over there and I still use them and they still go, they go hard, no problem. So that's all I've really got in my personal collection right now. So I always see a lot of the stuff like that big mortise chisel in the last video. I would love to have one of those. I have no use for that. I will never have a use for that, but I want one. 
and yeah i can genuinely say i i will not go bigger than an inch and a half mortise framing chisel like that one <clears throat> that's gonna be kind of my cutoff i mean unless somebody wants something for absolute novelty but the price would just get insane to go up to a two inch and i mean i i guess i would do it if i had to had to tr attempt it but the the thing is is that you have like that inch and a half mortise chisel was a chunk of steel square like that and if you think about it, I mean, I haven't ran the volume calculations on any of this stuff, but I really don't need to to know this, that if you go from inch and a half up to two inch, that's going to be like more than twice the material. And the struggle with that one was getting it up to the astenitizing temperature evenly through to the core of the material and then quenching it and getting all of that heat out of it. I mean, pulling all of that heat out of it, I'm not going to lie, it took probably an hour to get the heat out of that thing and i was worried about the hardness of it because generally speaking the the slower the quench rate the softer the material is going to be but and it's like no matter what i did the heat just kept pouring out of that thing and <clears throat> i use a really weird really unique heat treating process and I've never seen anything like it. I had to design and engineer and, and build all the equipment for it. And there's all kinds of stuff involved in it. And I mean, that thing pushed the limitations of my equipment. I probably could do, do it too much. I probably could, but I wouldn't advise it is what I'm saying. But if somebody absolutely has to have a two inch, I will try to talk them out of it. And if they absolutely have to have the two inch, I'll do it. But I mean, you'll be looking at just for the piece of blade material for that, probably $400 or, or more, just for the piece of bar stock to start with. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, that piece of bar stock for the inch and a half mortise chisel, I machined over 20 pounds of material off of that thing. That, no kidding, like 20 pounds of material off of that. It started out as a piece of two and a quarter by 18 A2. And that sucker was a lot of work. And so I would have to even, <clears throat> I'd have to run the math to see how big of a piece I would need for a two inch, but I have no plans in doing that, in doing that in anytime soon. But yeah, if you're interested in anything, have any great ideas? Know of any tools that don't exist anymore that you'd like to see revived? Andrew at KimmonsHandTools.com. I'll get back to you within a couple days, few days. Um, I try to catch up on platforms as I can. I'm extremely busy. So like when I'll hit my Facebook, I'll hit Messenger, I'll go through that. And then like it may be the next day or in a couple days before I get to another one and can get through everything. And sometimes it just takes me a couple days to get back to everybody in one platform and bounce to the next one. And so I try to work my way through everything to the best of my ability. I am a one man, one man band over here. So anyway, hope everyone has a great day out there and happy Monday. Uh, Andrew at KimmonsHandTools.com. You can follow me on Facebook, on uh, Instagram, Kimmons Hand Tools. And yep, yeah, that's all I've got for today. So have a great day out there and I'll see you next time.